Thanks for tuning in to part two of the Continental Divide Trail question answer video. Let's jump right into it. A handful more questions from James Backer. The AZT goes for the Grand Canyon. Are you afraid of falling in? Did you murder Jesus on the trail? Will you continue eating 4,000 calories a day when you're done hiking? And will you hike the AP next summer? I am not afraid of falling in the Grand Canyon. Um, I actually don't have a huge fear of heights with stationary objects. Uh, I'm just not into adrenaline, so I will never bungee jump or skydive because it just does not interest me. It just scares me. But I can stand next to uh, Grand Canyon or go up in a, a big fire tower or something like that without too much issue. So I'm not too worried about falling in. As far as uh, Jesus' disappearance, if you recall, my zero day in East Glacier, one of the last episodes, my last week on the CDT, you saw that Jesus showed back up. He finished the trail before I did, so he is alive and well, and he is a triple crowner. As for eating, I'm really hoping to bring down the amount of calories I eat because um, it's not going to be good for me. I'm going to gain weight way too quickly. So my sister, who is studying to be a um, registered dietitian, she's in grad school, she is hopefully going to make me a meal plan that I can stick to and maybe a little exercise with friends to keep me going uh, so that I don't blow back up to my pre-trail weight. And then um, as for hiking the AP next summer, I'm guessing you mean the AT, the Appalachian Trail, in which case I uh, could. It's, it's entirely possible. It's one of the plans floating around right now, but it's not set in stone. So we'll have to figure out this winter if I'm able to do it or if I'm going to have to jump back into a career and start making money soon. All right, I have a three-part question from General Big Man here, so I will split those up. First one is, what kind of advice would you give to a rookie who is preparing for a thru-hike? I believe this advice goes hand-in-hand -hand with a question replied earlier, and that is, get out into the suck and start walking in some terrible weather, and that'll get you prepared for that thru-hike. Hike on any day, actually, because even on a sunny day, that's physical preparation. But if you want physical and mental and get yourself going, Get out there when it's crap and see if you still like hiking then. The next question, what's an approximate budget a person would need to attempt a through hike? As far as budget goes, I subscribe to the same philosophy that most people do and the ones that you'd probably find with a Google search, which is $1,000 per month of hiking or $2 per mile hiked. And then you can take those two and make an average and that's probably what you spend. That's what I use. So I hiked for about six months. That's about uh, $6,000, but I took about a month off, so maybe closer to five. And I, I hiked about 2,300 miles, so that's about $4,600. So the average between 4,600 and 6,000 is uh, 5,300. So uh, I would say that 5,300 to $6,000 would be my estimated range that I would spend on a through hike. I haven't done my personal finances yet, so I don't know if I went over that number, but I'm really hoping it's right around that, and I expect it to be as well. And the final question, how much weight did you lose on the Continental Divide Trail? I did not lose too much weight on the CDT, and that's because I lost most of it on my previous through hike, my first one, the Te Araroa, just the South Island in New Zealand. That was about 812 miles, and I did it, finished it about a month before starting the CDT. On that trail, I lost roughly 50 pounds, and then I gained about 20 back in my month off between trails, just eating up. And on the CDT, I believe I got back down to that same weight. Um, this is estimated just looking at my own body. Not, I didn't have any scales available, so I'm guessing I'm around the same weight when I finished the TA. So that would mean I lost in an, about 20 pounds on the CDT, and that would put me at a total of about still about netting 50 pounds lost since before I started through hiking, which would be any time before 2019. This next question comes from Torin Vallone. When will you reunite with your tramway? Everyone I met on the Connell Divide Trail um, that I ended up being in a tramway with, I really enjoyed spending my time with them, and uh, they're all pretty cool people. So I have a lot of their contact information, but I don't believe there's any immediate plans to uh, meet up with anyone other than, say, Jesus. He and I probably became the closest friends of anybody in the trail family groups that I've had throughout the trail. Here is, we spent over three months together on this trail, and he lives pretty close to me in central, north central Mass, and I live in central New York, so 
um, probably within five to seven hours, which is closer than almost everybody else that I hung out with. So there's potential that I meet back up with him to do some cool stuff in the Northeast uh, every now and again. But other than that, I don't believe I have any plans to meet up with other uh, family members. Not to say I don't want to, just I don't think it's going to happen. Unless you know, one of us is traveling and wants to come see the other person while they're out and about. This next question comes from Rigby Bucolic. Um, do you remember your route taken with all the alternates? If so, would you make it public for people like me who hope to do the trail next year? I do remember my entire route taken, and I can make that public for you. It sounds like it might be a little bit of work, but I can find a way to do that for sure. Just don't expect it to come out um, anytime soon. I'll probably get it up this winter, but definitely before anybody would start it through like next year. So uh, yeah, I'll put that on my list of uh, upcoming videos so I can get a whole breakdown for you guys and maybe you might take a couple Jandals alternates if you are so inclined. This next question comes from Denny Harbaugh, who happens to be my aunt. Uh, I'd like to know if there's anything you wish you'd done differently on the CDT, either on trail or prepping for it, and how that will impact your approach to the AZT. This may have already been answered earlier, but uh, it goes along the same lines. If in terms of preparation, I think I did everything I needed to do, except for maybe a little more snow hiking, but I don't think it could have prepared me for the insane amount of snow levels that uh, happened in Colorado. But as far as everything else went, I was pretty happy with the amount of preparation I did. And one of the things I learned while on trail is that I don't really need to prepare as much as I think I do. And uh, I've learned from a lot of cool people that going with the flow works just as well. So I actually have become a little more lax with planning and I don't even have any plans for the AZT. Most of the planning that is required for the AZT is being done by a good friend, Medicine Man, who you know, I'm hiking the trail with, and he'll have the water caches already put into place that'll help us just have an easier hike. And um, from there, we'll just use you know Gut Hook and Facebook page and stuff like that to navigate our way through just by time. I'm actually starting to enjoy not having to plan as much anymore, and it's been working out really well. So that's a cool thing I learned on trail. So if there's anything I wish I had done differently on the CDT, it would be to either start later, do it on a different year, or do it southbound. And that all has to do with just avoiding that insane Colorado snow. Everything else, I think, went really well. And the second part of the question... Since I know you and how well you prepare for things, because I am, were there places on the CDT where you found yourself unprepared? And if so, how do you work around that? In New Mexico, I felt unprepared for the cold in March, and, or rather April. There was some really cold temperatures that came through the desert while I was hiking through my first section of the trail. So there was... Uh, snow that I ran into in Davila Ranch, if you guys remember that, you know, and some cold rain and some really heavy winds. And I didn't have a hat, I didn't have gloves, didn't have any extra layers besides a puffy. So there were a lot of nights I was hanging out pretty cold, just in all my wind gear and stuff like that. So I was unprepared for cold in the desert. And um, I, I've never been to the desert before then, so it makes sense that I would have a, a newbie mistake like that, thinking that the desert's always hot, so, you know, I don't have to worry about it too much. So, I, if I were to do that again, I would definitely just bring my, at least my hat and gloves and maybe one more layer with me through that area because uh, it was cold enough to necessitate it. Uh, Colorado, I felt like I was overly prepared. I think I had so much equipment that I was bogged down by it and it made me really tired and it was probably also a reason why I post hold so much because there was just so much weight so if I were to do that again I would bring less snow gear I wouldn't go so crazy with it and um, I might also leave the snowshoes behind either that or maybe get smaller ones I had some really big ones because of uh, how much I weighed before I started the trail so I want to make sure to have the proper size but after losing weight they were just overkill and they were hard to walk in and they caused a lot of problems, so I ended up sending them home. They are so big and bulky, and I'm not sure if I would have felt better just trudging through the snow, but uh, it definitely would have been nice to have that extra four or five pounds of weight off, so I would definitely change those things. And then, like I mentioned before, uh, being unprepared, just I'm prepared for mostly everything, but just as far as comfort goes, I would definitely go you know, southbound or something like that just to uh, get around those uh, incredibly dangerous areas in terms of snow and other weather.
in terms of finding myself unprepared on trail. That only happened once, and that was in uh, mid-Montana, right before Helena, uh, after Butte. Uh, I was about 35 miles shy of the road, and my phone died in a rainstorm, and my backup maps were actually not downloaded on my Garmin inReach, which was my own fault. So I lost my primary and my backup forms of navigation at the same time, and I was stuck uh, trying to get to town just based off of memory because a lot of junctions during this section of trail were not marked. So I had about seven mar unmarked junctions, and luckily I guessed right on six of them, but um, I didn't realize until you know, I could finally see via my compass and, um, and tracking on my GPS that I was going too far in the wrong direction that I realized I was totally screwed and the only thing left to do was to get help so I messaged my dad on my Garmin and he gave me some turn-by-turn -turn directions to get me back on trail to a marked junction that almost led me the entire way out until I ran into another hiker that helped me further so that was the one time I had trouble on trail with being unprepared and I was able to solve that by messaging my dad so he could bail me out Ali W asks, are you going to stay focused on diet and exercise and off-trail life? And also, are you looking for a way to mix your future work with hiking? So I believe the question about diet and exercise was uh, answered earlier, but uh, just a basic overview is I'm hoping that my sister can get me on a meal plan and then exercise with friends. So yes, I'm going to try to stay on top of my diet and exercise when I get off trail. And then as far as the uh, other question goes, I would love to be able to hike um, and mix that in with work. I would love to be able to do seasonal or contract work. Unfortunately, if I go with my degree program, which is engineering, they don't really do that. So you don't really have travel engineering or um, contract work or anything like that. And it's one of the types of careers that once you get into a job, you're expected to stay there for a long time. So. Any move I make into the engineering field will probably be a career move. The only thing I that I would see doing that doesn't involve that would be working seasonally just so that I can do another hike next season or something like that. So that would probably be like working at an REI or something random like that where I would not be using my degree and I would just be you know saving up some money and not really moving ahead towards retirement in any way but building enough money to do some more hikes. And I still haven't decided which... Uh, path I want to take yet. So I don't actually know what I'm going to be doing, but uh, one of them is either going to be all hiking or very little hiking, but you might just, I might just turn into a weekender at some point soon, unfortunately. Also, do you like movies about gladiators? And have you ever been in a Turkish prison? I would say the gladiator movies are all right. Um, I've enjoyed watching them before. Love the 300 series, but uh, not huge on my list of things to watch. I'm usually into the comedies and horrors, but um, you know, Gladiator stuff's still pretty cool. And no, I've never been in a Turkish prison. I've never even been to Turkey. I've never even been to Europe. I have a two-part question from Lenny Hikes. Um, I thought the CDT was more like 3,000 miles. Was your distance shorter because of necessary detours due to snow, such as the San Juans? Also, what are your plans for 2020? You are correct that the official uh, Continental Divide Trail is 3,014.5 miles, and that is the red line that kind of snakes its way all the way up through the divide. Um, it is mostly, or not mostly, mostly marked, but uh, partially unmarked, not all the way off of roads yet, and a lot of those sections are not that great compared to their alternates. So the reason why my hike was about 2,300 miles is because I took most alternates because they were more scenic and beautiful and they also happen to be shorter and then some of them I took actual shortcuts in order to avoid weather. So you're absolutely right, the San Juans was a perfect example. The San Juans were incredibly dangerous at the time of year that I was going through and I didn't want to risk it, especially with having such little experience in mountaineering and snow and ice weather at high altitudes like that. So. My group and I decided to take the low route through uh, that area, and that skipped about 92 miles, I think. Another example is the Gila in New Mexico. The black range that the Gila cuts off, which is the official route, has almost no water. You need to rely on human water caches, and it's desert mountains that are pretty uh, oppressively hot and very little shade. 
versus the Gila River, which is full of flora, fauna, uh, cliff dwellings, hot springs, giant uh, cliff walls, and big river crossings. It's so much better, and it cuts off about 70 to 75 miles of the trail. And then there's other big ones, like the one I took from Yellowstone to Butte instead of along the Idaho-Montana border. That cut off about 360 miles, and that was to make it to the border of Canada in time before the snow hit Glacier. And if you guys saw my finale, timed it just right down to the day. So I was really glad afterwards to have made that decision so that I wouldn't have to quit my hike like several dozen people had to do because they didn't make it to the border in time and the snow is too difficult to get past. As far as plans for 2020, I think I've uh, made it clear already, but um, I'll say it again. I really don't know. I have a couple options. Either pick up a job uh, seasonally and then hike the AT with the friends or um, you know, do something like that I'd love to do, but also I wouldn't mind jumping into a career now that I've had this year off of experience and, um, you know, time to goof off and do exactly what I want and love. And now might be a good time to jump into a career and start making some money and building my retirement. So it could go either way. And I have no idea how to, I think you might even know more than I would, which way I'm headed. I really have no clue, but I'll be picking one of those here pretty soon this winter when I'm forced into it. I am a creature of procrastination. That's in my, it's in my blood. This question comes from O Thong Soon. Excuse my, uh, lack of pronunciation if I did it wrong, but uh, what do you think of Canada? I love Canada, and I feel like I haven't seen enough of it, and I'd really like to see more of it. Um, at home, the only time I really spent in Canada was in Toronto or Montreal. A little bit of time in some small towns in Quebec and Ontario around Niagara Falls, but that's about it. And then this is the first time I've come through uh, kind of western or central Canada. So going up through Alberta, seeing some beautiful mountains on the hitch ride up to Calgary. But um, Waterton is a beautiful town with some incredibly nice people. Canadian hospitality is real. The people are very polite and nice and helpful. And uh, the food's great too. I love poutine. <laughs> and um, I'd love to explore some more, especially like Banff and Jasper are the usual cliches, but also um, I've heard really good things about you know, Vancouver and Squamish and like all the islands and things like that. So it's a beautiful country that I'd like to check out more of, but I already love everything I've seen so far. Next, we have a question from Mary Carpenter. Are you going to shave before hiking Arizona? Well, I'm not sure if this is already an indication, but I have no plans to shave uh, before or during my time in Arizona. I'll reserve that for a little while after I get home. I still need to shock some friends and family when I return back to New York and you know, hang out with it for a little while and maybe even incorporate it into uh, I don't know some holiday theme something, but I don't know. But either way, this is not going to be a permanent look. I'm not huge on the beard, so uh, I'll be glad to shave it back down to my usual beard, just uh, shave pretty close to the face. So uh, for now, yeah, it stays. The next question comes from Mark Platon. Have you done the PCT? I have not done the PCT. The Connell Divide Trail was my first U.S. thru-hike and my second thru-hike overall. Uh, before that, I did the South Island of New Zealand along the Te Araroa. That was about 812 miles. And then the CDT was about uh, 2,310. And then my upcoming hike of the AZT should be about 788. So I have not done any other trails besides uh, those two previously and the one coming up. Other than that, I would love to hike those trails. I don't have anything against them. I just haven't gotten into any of these trails yet, as I just graduated university last December, and that's when my uh, quote-unquote freedom began. <laughs> okay, another batch of questions from James Backer. How will you keep the weight off when you aren't hiking? Was your yellow blazing under 200 miles on the CDT? All right, so I definitely answered um, how I'll plan on keeping the weight off, so that's taken care of. Uh, in terms of yellow blazing, I did zero miles of yellow blazing. For those of you that don't know, that means uh, hitchhiking around sections or taking rides to skip sections. I uh, did a full continuous footstep walk from Mexico to Canada, did not miss a beat. 
Adding on to that, do you have to return to Hawaii for the community service you owe for your drunken public arrests? Were you really permanently banned from the Chinese buffet on Oahu? And Darwin did the AZT last year. Are you just copycatting him? I was never arrested in Hawaii for a drunken public. I was actually never arrested at all. Um, although, I, there are probably a couple times I definitely had a little too much to drink and I probably shouldn't have been out in the streets. But uh, definitely didn't do anything illegal, so that's a good start. And uh, I was never permanently banned from any establishments in Hawaii or any establishments at all in my life. So that's a pretty good record going. Uh, let's try to see if I can keep that going. Although I am surprised they don't kick hikers out of all-you-can-eat buffets because we can take down some pretty intense amount of food for sure. As far as Darwin doing the AZT, I did not know that he did that. Um, I was just doing the AZT because my friend Medicine Man was going to do it, so I figured I'd jump on with him so I could spend some time with him. And um, during my time, during the time that I believe Darwin was doing the AZT, which I'm told now was in the spring, uh, I was in the middle of doing uh, preparation for the CDT and hiking the CDT. Um, after coming back from the TA, so I was unaware of that, so I don't believe that I'd be copycatting him, and uh, I don't really have a reason to or plan to. This next question comes from Cook Jane Cook, one of my trail angels on the CDT. Fenton, her son, would like to know, how old was the youngest thru-hiker that you met on the CDT? The youngest person in general that I met on the trail um, that was attempting a thru-hike of it was Reuben Perley. It was the family of Perleys, man and his two sons, uh, Reuben and Matthew. They were uh, trying to document a thru-hike of the CDT, so they had tons of camera equipment. Uh, they ended up quitting around Steamboat Springs because they were pretty confident they weren't going to make it before the end of the season, and they're going to, I believe, attempt to finish it next year. Um, Reuben, I believe, is about 12 years old. I don't know his actual age, but I think he's around there. So he's definitely the youngest person, Matthew being the second because he is about 16. Um, the youngest person I met to have finished the trail is uh, Strep. He is 19 years old. So um, I think that's the youngest person I met to finish. So. As far as I'm concerned, as long as you are pretty confident in your abilities and you have the right support system if you need it, you're never too old to be hiking the, the CDT or any long trail for that matter, as long as you can stay safe. So Fenton, I'd say get out there, man. It's going to be fun. And uh, thanks again to the Brummett family who helped me out so much on this trail. This question comes from RC Burger 6 What made you hike the CDT versus the PCT? Also, compared to your expectations prior to your start, what was easier and harder? The main reason I hiked the CDT over the PCT is because it's less populated and more wild and uh, gave me more of that primal feeling that I was looking for out of a hike. Also because I couldn't get my permit for the PCT, so that just made the logistics for the CDT quite a bit easier. In terms of easier or harder, I think the snow was a lot harder than I expected it to be in Colorado. Um, I thought the desert was quite a bit easier in the Great Divide Basin and... Uh, southern New Mexico than I expected it to be, but I also went through southern New Mexico in a pretty chilly time of year in like April, so I escaped the incredible heat, so that's probably why it felt a lot easier. I also got through before rattlesnake season, so I didn't have to deal with too much wildlife. Uh, everything else was pretty much right on par with what I expected it to be, so that worked out pretty nicely. The final question of the CDT Q&A comes from Homeless Jake, who you might also know as Jesus, my hiking partner for most of the Continental Divide Trail. His question is, how many margaritas did you drink on trail? Well, pretty much every margarita I drank on trail was with Jesus, and I was with him for about three months, and I'd say we had maybe four margaritas a week, or section, so maybe that'd be once a week. So... Uh, what, 12 weeks times 4 a week, 48, round up, maybe like 50 margaritas, I'd say somewhere. Somewhere around 50 margaritas, I think, is a pretty good guess for the entire trail. So that's a that's a pretty good haul, I'd say. <laughs> I had a good time with it, though, so that's a, an extra added benefit to the cost.